Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're a bit before the hour, so I've started the broadcast, but we're going to wait a few more minutes yet until we have a full house, and then we will get going. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We're going to wait just another minute to let more people join the, the presentation before we get started. Alrighty, we're going to get started with a little bit of introductory materials and then we'll switch over to the main presentation in just a few minutes. My name is Leah Freeberg from Fluke Excelix and thank you for joining us for this month's best practice webinar. Pretty sure you all know Fluke as a test tool provider, the yellow, famous yellow tools. Um, and you may also actually by this point know us for our thermal imagers and our vibration meters, but you may not know that all of these measurements now flow automatically into the cloud and from there into a lot of different EAM systems of records. And the background behind all of that, the stuff that makes it work is called Fluke Excelix. Therefore, this series is sponsored by Fluke Excelix as our framework, our backend framework for making all the, the data, all the reliability data that we collect flow into systems where it can be analyzed, trended, used, and to trigger further action. So it all turns around condition-based maintenance. And for that reason, for this webinar series, we try to bring in speakers like Dr. Blake, who have some of the best expertise in the industry to share so that we can pull everyone forward into best practices around reliability maintenance. Before the presentation though, I have a few housekeeping items. Today's session is being recorded, so your phone lines are muted and that's to minimize background noise. We will save time after the presentation for questions. You can ask questions at any point by using the question feature. Go ahead now and find it in your webinar tool. You can type in your questions and we will track those. And then when Dr. Blake is done with the presentation, we will go in and read those questions out loud and answer as many as we can. If we don't get through all the questions, we will try to answer them after the webinar and send you that information later. The recorded webinar will also be available on the excelx.com site under webinars, and everyone who stays through the end and completes the survey will receive a copy of Dr. Blake's slides. All right, so that's it for housekeeping. 
And now for the main event. Today, obviously, we are very pleased to have with us Dr. Klaus Blake, Director of the Reliability and Maintainability Center at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Klaus will be presenting about what you should know about predictive technologies and their impact on maintenance reliability. Klaus has more than 35 years of experience in various areas of manufacturing and continuous improvement processes and people, including lean manufacturing, reliability and maintenance, competitive analysis, continuous improvement tools and techniques, new facility planning and implementation, industrial engineering, ergonomics and change management. Honestly, having worked with, with Klaus for a while, there's really nothing that the guy can't do. It's pretty impressive. He's also a past two-year chairman of SMRP and helped initiate the organization. And his most recent book is The Relativity of Continuous Improvement, Learning How to Work on What Matters. And I hear he has another book on the works, which is very exciting. So if you've ever heard Klaus speak, you know he has some great stories to tell about factory maintenance. And you may also know that he is one heck of a researcher. So today's presentation is going to be a great chance for us to get updated on his latest findings and probably some of his latest stories. Klaus will also be speaking at Fluke's Accelerate Conference later this fall in Florida. Very exciting again, but more on that later. So good morning, Klaus. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. We, we all good to go? I, I think we are all good to go. Um, why don't you forward our slides to this poll question? Because since... Uh, since our topic today is a lot about the status of, of maintenance, predictive maintenance, reactive maintenance in the industry, I'd like to get a sense for where people are at. So I'm going to trigger a poll question that everyone can respond to right now. So on your screen, you're going to see questions. You can select one if you don't mind. And while, we're, while people are thinking and, and clicking, I'm going to ask Klaus another question. All right. So would you mind, I know you have a lot of stories, but would you mind sharing one example of a plant you've been to recently that had that has been making some progress? Um, because it helps us to know what you saw and what impressed you. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you, know, you know, maybe what I'm going to pick is, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, probably about a year ago, but I think it's worth sharing. It's so uh, you know I, I have the opportunity to get involved with uh, being being a judge for the best reliable plant uh, at, at the Emerson Exchange, which which is a you know you know a, a yeah. different venue, uh, but it gets me into various plants and looking at at data and how they're doing. And one of the things I always find you know, you know or at least you know, some people find hard to judge is, is really scale. You know some people are starting yep. with almost nothing, and, and as they're as they're trying to build stuff, I mean it's by they're by themselves. Uh, others, uh, they're huge complexes like uh, mm -hmm. Audi Aramco working with Dow, and they've got 200 reliability engineers starting out, like 200 <laughs> some. So, right. how, do you, how do you compare that to somebody that's saying, "I have a vision about doing reliability uh, at our new operation startup"? You know, so yeah. And so I want to talk about that one because because that one to me is is more impressive. Not that the other ones aren't; uh, they're, they're all phenomenal efforts. Mm -hmm. But a person that starts with a vision and then puts together a program that, that's at least, you know, in many cases, close to best practice, that's even more impressive to me. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Particular one, uh, it was a uh, ethanol plant. I believe they were, nor if I remember right, uh, north of Montreal. It's a Greenfield Ethanol. Uh -huh. uh, they actually uh, won the award uh, uh, the other year. And uh, they're, they're low, you know, obviously located in eastern Canada there. And what was very unique, again, it was one person with a vision having put it together. He started from nothing, put together a reliability maintainability program. I mean, you know, doing all the basics from, uh, you know, having, uh, you know, 50 plus kitting locations, uh, putting all the materials together, the materials, uh, uh, people, once everything's in a box that was sealed and attached to a work order, you know, tied into their CMMS. They did a lot of stuff on visual controls and inspection. You know, did all their 5S, but at the end of the time, and, and, and this didn't happen in a year or so, this is something that was done over eight, nine, ten years, this one person's vision, and slowly it grew from one person to fi a 15-person staff. Wow. And if you look at what they've done in that time, uh, their million liters per year of ethanol produced uh, pretty much doubled in what? that time. So they doubled wow. their production. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And, and then during that same time, uh, you know, their overtime was pretty much cut in half. Uh, their maintenance uh, schedule compliance improved by an, an additional 10%. Uh, 
Uh, you know, they were in the 80s, and you know, then they went to the 90s. Wow. Uh, their, their budget was uh, um, uh, a little bit unfavorable. And, and when I say budget, you know, you can play games with budgets, but their budget was pretty steady over the 10 years. The only increase was inflation. You know, so it that wasn't like awesome. the budget went higher, so they looked good. But their budget was was uh, you know, just barely favorable or about breaking even. And the last year, their budget was 11% favorable, basically saying they saved money. Uh, do, doing doing twice as much production, you know, with, with the same equipment. Uh, shutdowns instead of every six months are happening every year and a half, and, and so on. So the only maintenance true. cost increase was really inflation uh, o o over that entire time period. And what was really unique, too, on top of that, during that entire time, you know, we always talk about, or not as much talk about, the impact of energy if you do all the right things and reliability and maintainability. So during that time, uh, energy uh, energy uh, costs went down 26%. You know, so so again, uh, you know, this is a to me this is a program that started with a person's vision, and when I look today with all the struggles, it's about implementation, and that's why I share mm -hmm. that story. Mm -hmm. That you know, one person with the right vision, the right tenacity, I'll call it stick to itiveness, they can make a difference. Wow, that 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 is a heck of a story. Thank you very much. That <laughs> I couldn't ask for more. We have some great answers uh, on our poll question, and we do have the majority of folks coming in at fifty percent or higher on the percentage of maintenance uh, on reactive maintenance. Oh. Um, obviously, we're not looking for zero. So a big part of think what you're going to be talking about is what percentage we are looking for for reactive maintenance, and then a little bit on how to get there. So I'm going to hide these answers here and take one last look at 50%, 54% of folks saying 50% or higher. We've got 18% of folks saying uh, about 40% reactive maintenance and another 30 saying, um, uh, another, I'm sorry, another 15% of folks saying 30% or higher. So the majority of our audience is, is up there. Okay, I'm gonna hide that which should put the control back to you, Klaus. And well, the, you, the good news, I guess, out of that is I call mm -hmm. that opportunity rich. You can only get better. You know? There you so, go. There so, you go. So you take I'll it take away. the positive approach. So uh, exactly. What, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to I'm going to a couple of different things on how it all ties together, and we'll look at some real live benchmarks. What's going on in North America today, and where I think plants should be, and and and, and if you're not top core town, if you're operating at uh, above 50%, you're probably bottom quartile as far as reactive maintenance, and I'll show that later in the slide. Uh, if, if you're bottom quartile versus top quartile in reactive maintenance, it probably costs you more than six times more to run your business than it should. You know, and I'll show you some slides tied into that. So what we want to talk about is, I want to call it, it's, you know, it transition to excellence, how it's all related. And I look at any business that, that they want to maximize their return on investment. And when I did the stuff with uh, Cadillac and General Motors and, and a lot of other other uh, you know plants tied together with that, you know we use these five things. And it doesn't matter what business you're in, you got to focus on safety. You got to focus on the people, the culture, the engagement, the quality, and then your uptime or throughput. And that's your inventory turns also in your cost. It doesn't matter what business you're in. You can call it what you want. You got to get good at these five things if, to get your maximum ROI. So. Let's just start by talking about understanding how it's all related. And you know, it says I need maintenance now. Well, hopefully you've got you know, you know some uh, classifications between what's preventive, you know, what's time-based, what's predictive, other kinds of maintenance. Hopefully you have some kind of asset criticality uh, tied into a CMMS system. And and then you, what do you you know? So it gets into what do you do when and setting priorities. Uh, hopefully you've uh, split off the capital expenditure projects. I still see a lot of uh, people using maintenance folks to do quick jobs, and, and uh, which really should be capital expenditures, and then they wonder why they can't make budget or have enough people tied to maintenance. Uh, I still see a lot of places not managing backlog. If you don't manage your backlog, well, well, how do you get any better? Uh, I, I see places with – I've seen backlog as bad as two years. I mean, they're done. I mean, they didn't even know what their backlog was. But if, you know, I see a lot of places up 10, 20, 30 weeks backlog. And again, uh, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here since you're all in that business. But again, what that's telling your customer production is that if you have a 20-week backlog, you're telling them 
I'll get there right away as soon as I can in 20 weeks if nothing else goes wrong. So no wonder they find different ways to work around the system and, and to try to get it all to implementation as quickly as possible. While you do some planning, obviously you need to tie into your spare parts process. And since the average reactive maintenance was so high, I'll say it over and over again, that if you're high in reactive maintenance, like your data that I saw, you'll never have enough spare parts. doesn't matter what you do. Again, if you're high in reactive maintenance, you will never have enough spare parts. So obviously you're gonna do some planning and scheduling. Then somebody actually has to do the maintenance. Hopefully you're keeping some kind of task history. It all goes in the master data file. Hopefully there's some financials tied to that as to what kind of money are you spending on your assets. And if, and if you have some data that you think is halfway worthwhile, now you can do some reliability growth analysis. And oh, by the way, I see less than 3% of North America using those kind of tools when it gets to reliability growth and using them properly. Because you should be able to know on your equipment, is it a reliability problem, is it an efficiency problem, and, and take the right action. But again, you can't do that unless you have good data. And then if you're collecting some of that knowledge, now you can put it into design for reliability and maintainability. And maybe differentiating between a couple terms, uh, we all know what reliability is, we won't go through that definition, but a lot of people use the words maintenance and maintainability interchangeably. Uh, maintenance is the service function of actually repairing, replacing, fixing the part of the asset. And ideally, you'd rather not have to do that if you're catching it ahead of time, uh, you know, and, or, or just may, maybe you're making a change out. But then there's the other word, maintainability. What maintainability is, is it's a designed in parameter. Like, are you designing for accessibility? Are you designing so you can get to parts uh, that are hard to get to, so you don't have to uh, break other parts and trying to replace a part that maybe uh, has a problem once a month? And so there's 33 plus parameters that need to be designed in for maintainability. And most people aren't willing to do that. If you're not doing the life cycle costing on your purchasing specs, if, if your purchasing doesn't have uh, reliability and maintainability guidelines in the purchasing of assets, you're not doing design for maintainability and you're automatically paying more to get all that work done. Uh, that hopefully drives all your key performance indicators. And that in turn then drives your continuous improvement and that links back into your overall R&M strategy. That's kind of an ideal state. And hopefully all that's tied somehow to your CMMS system. Unfortunately, studies that I've looked at in multiple CMMS systems, I mean, looking at all the popular ones, uh, the study pretty much found that it's rare that anybody uses more than 30% of the capability of any CMMS system. That's kind of sad when you think about that. And the typical response I get, you're right, it's usually less than 20%. And that might mean it doesn't get you exactly what you need, the master data files aren't right, all the bill materials aren't linked properly, uh, someone still owns the change master so it's too expensive to make ongoing changes and it goes on and on. And uh, we won't overkill that. But now that, that was ideal, so what really happens in the real world? You know, do you schedule 100% of your maintenance? If not, you should. How reactive are you? Okay, we just answered that question. And we'll talk about what I see as uh, uh, data in North America. You have a properly used asset criticality. Uh, again, if your customers don't trust you, all of a sudden everything becomes a safety problem because then it gets done because your backlog's too high. But do you really have proper asset criticality defined? Are you trained precision maintenance trained? Meaning, do they really know how to change that bearing? You know, you know we've been in Fortune 50, 100 companies and they wonder why they're having problems you hear a bunch of banging going on and you walk around the corner and you see it, uh, you see a, a trade sitting on the floor, you know, pounding on the side of a bearing, putting it on, sitting on a plant floor. Now that, that obviously is not precision maintenance. Uh, we found that, that there's a four to one more savings if you properly get into precision maintenance. How integrated is your CMMS? Where we just talked about that with most of the capabilities really not being implemented. Are your maintenance tasks optimized? I've never gone into a place where we haven't been able to take out 20 to 25, 30% of the maintenance tasks or extend them or change them or make them better. 
the highest I've seen is about 50% where we've gone in and basically said, stop doing half of what you're doing. And the first reaction early on was, well, where do I get my resources to do the technologies, follow the condition monitoring, and so on? Well, that place, they got 50% of their resources back because now they don't have to do that maintenance. They got half their resources back to do all the right stuff now. And as I said, if, you, if you're highly reactive, you never have enough spare parts, and you can look at various metrics, like is your stocked MRO inventory value more than 30% of your total maintenance cost? So there's KPIs you can look at. Your metrics reflect your daily practices. Uh, what I find out often going in the plants, the metrics on the wall look pretty good. And I go on a plant floor, and it usually takes 5, 10, 50 minutes, and I say that can't be happening. And usually what that means is, you know, people are trying to cost cut their way to best practices. Uh, there's different ways. Uh, I, always, I always like to look at three different metrics meaning, and, and say that any one KPI is dangerous by itself. Uh, for example, uh, when, when I, uh, we were implementing all the stuff in uh, all the General Motors plants, uh, we knew maintenance cost was going to go up a little bit, but the target wasn't maintenance cost. The target was manufacturing cost per vehicle. So if manufacturing cost per vehicle didn't go down several hundreds of dollars during that same time period, then I wouldn't be doing my job. So, so again, you always got to look at more than one metric as you go forward. Does PM compliance reflect everything? What happens to tasks not done? You know, more than places I want to admit that I see that, that they'll, they'll uh, say, well, we, we're going to get to it next month anyway, so we just kind of let it go because we can't get it all done. But then they don't count those the dings against them in PM compliance, saying, "Well, it's going to happen anyway." So again, you, can, you know, it, it's what do those values really look like? Which should they be, and, and, and are they accurately reflected? Are your maintenance tasks repeatable? Can you take two, three trades or technicians, and you can you get about the same results? If not, it's a, it could be a skills issue. It could be a precision maintenance training issue. Does your PDM uh, or predictive perform metric reflect all the needed tasks on all of your assets? Uh, another example is to go in and say, well, we do 95, we're 95 percent compliant on our PMs, including technologies. And then you ask the question, you go out on the floor and say that can't be, and you go back in and ask and say, are you doing predictive technologies on all the assets that you think need it? And they're very quick to say, well, no, we don't have the kind of resources for that. And I said, how much of your assets are you doing? on what you think should be done. Oh, we're, we're barely hitting 20, 30% of those things that should be done. So what you're telling me what's on the wall is 30% of your assets. You're doing 95% PM compliance on 30% of your assets, and the other 70% are not getting hardly anything. And they said, well, that, that's correct. And I said, well, that's, your plant manager doesn't know that. And it's, it's unfortunate how many times I go through that scenario. What do your planners, reliability engineers do? Uh, they may they may be down as reliability and plant engineers, but then you go to planners and can't find them and say, where is he? Oh, we, well, he's driving a fork truck because this guy isn't in today. Or I spend all my time chasing parts, expediting uh, because of the process. I really don't have time to, to plan much. We pretty much just schedule. Again, we can talk a day on that. What does your plant manager see? You know, from a plant manager's perspective, they're seeing the numbers and they're just seeing the results and they're just seeing headcount in place. And so, again, you've got to help them understand the process to, to help yourself get better. So let's move on a little bit to the current state of predictive technologies and what, what's being seen out there. This comes from a Plant Services magazine. Uh, I'll show a more updated one in a second. But I mean, this would bother me. It says that almost 60% of the people are not happy with their predictive maintenance program. It actually looks like it's gotten worse uh, from 2014 to 2016. Now, updating some of that to more recent, getting to 2018, still almost 60% of North America says that their process or program in predictive maintenance is not effective or needs some improvement. So, so just way, way too much opportunity still needed for, for this kind of stuff having been around this long. I did a deeper dive in this data because uh, I, I do some analysis behind the scenes on these questions. And so I was able to dig a little deeper on that question. 
And, uh, and if you look at it in the bottom here, you have average percent reactive maintenance. And those people uh, that felt that, that uh, they didn't have a, a uh, effective um, uh, maintenance program also had much higher reactive maintenance. So, the, so those that felt they had an effective program were also getting the results. That means they're doing some other things right around the predictive technologies. So, so again, reactive maintenance really falls right in line with their satisfaction of the program. Also, I thought I'd look at design and maintainability since we talked about that. And that's really how you solve some of the problems up front rather than waiting for them to happen. And so it was how impactful has more design and maintainability uh, been on reliability. And again, as you do less and less uh, uh, design for maintainability, uh, your reactive maintenance is higher. And so as you do more and more design for maintainability going to the right, you have less reactive maintenance. The, the, the very high to significant use or impact of design for maintainability being 37% reactive. It's not where you want to be, but it's better than all the other ones. I've had this slide for a while, and I revalidate it all the time to see if the data is still, still representative. And I've done uh, three major studies, and I'm just getting ready or really in progress of doing the next big study uh, on uh, r and benchmarking. And the first study was done around 1991. Uh, then it was repeated in 2008-9, which is some of what you're seeing here. Then it was looked at again about a year and a half, two years ago, and I'm going to repeat the study again, uh, actually starting about a month ago. And in 2007, before this study that you're looking at came out, I took some risks and I published the numbers, that's the percents that are in the yellow boxes in squared and black. And I said that if you want to be best practice, you should be about 10% reactive maintenance, that's the top quartile best practice, however you want to call it, plus or minus 5%, depending on your business and, and some decisions you make within your business. And what the results showed me was that the actual data in 2008-2009 was about 34%. And, and, but I also asked them, where do you think you should be? And that answer came 10 to 12%, depending on whether I'm looking at some of the best performers or not. So that's right in line with, the, with where I said it should be. So it says that they're not where they should be, but they kind of know where they should be. They just don't know how to get there, or they struggle getting there within their business processes. Uh, predictive maintenance, I said about 25%. And I want to clarify, this is the finding, not the work orders doing the fixing. So doing predictive maintenance, that's, that's doing all the predictive technologies. That's doing analysis on that. In addition, any analysis tied to condition-based monitoring or setting it up. I said you should spend 25% of your resources doing the finding. Then if you go over to preventive, on, and, and again, the results show that um, the actual is about 12%, but they feel they should be about 25 So, So people understand where they think they should be on average. They just don't know how to get there. Then the rest I threw into preventive, and based on all the six curves and all the stuff, the, the five, six studies that have been done looking at all the reliability curves, uh, my average I see is about set, not more than 17% time based. So I say about, you know, you shouldn't target more than 20% time based in an ideal condition. And then 45% that's left of that corrective maintenance that's doing the work orders, two thirds of that should be doing the fixing from what you find doing the te predictive technologies. And 40, two thirds of 45% is 30%. So it's 25% doing the predictive technologies at least 30% of your time doing the fixing of what you find doing the predictive technologies. That's half your resources, at least tied up doing finding, fixing, finding, fixing, and that's how you get better. I use this chart because it's a good lead in to the, to the following uh, one that's coming up. And about nine, 10 years ago, I did this survey. This was several thousands and thousands of responses. In the North America response, the highest one was 26% saying we've got to fix people and culture. And if we don't learn how to implement better using people, culture, and engagement on the plant floor, we're not going to get better at the tough stuff on the plant floor. And the reason I bring this up is because I'm seeing that based on data now. 
And, and these were the top themes uh, that I saw that people had. So 26% people and culture improvement. Now let, let's look at what's happening in North America. And, and this is uh, you know, hundreds of companies representing uh, more than 3,000 facilities. So it's a pretty big database. Uh, so I feel pretty comfortable with the data. Um, I mentioned I did the first study back in 91, and North America was about 54% reactive maintenance. Uh, then I did the study again, that, that the previous couple, couple slides ago chart, it was about 34% reactive maintenance. That was average North America. Um, then I redid the study around 2015, and it only went down to 31% in North America. I did a little bit smaller database study in 2018, it didn't change, 31% in North America. And the average of the SMRP data uh, that, that uh, I analyzed, uh, gosh, probably about a year and a half ago now, the average of that time frame ended up there about 30%. So not there, that far off of my data. Uh, my database is about 20 times larger, so I, I would trust that first anyway. Um, but it's a good, good comparison still from some different companies. Uh, so what did they tell us in the previous slide? They said, if we don't get better at people and culture, we're going to come to a screeching halt 10 years from now. So that was 2008. Now we're 10 years later. And guess what? That's exactly what happened. If we don't get better at engaging the plant floor, it doesn't mean every plant in North America is doing bad, but on average, it is not getting better anymore. So let's take that and talk a little bit about knowing select key facts and what impacts. Uh, again, a lot of this has to do with implementation. Uh, you know, we have access to about 15 different models. This is kind of a tiered model that we use uh, at the university as we, we do three-day assessments with plants and roll stuff out. But the important part isn't so much which model you use, but do you have a process that you go through? You know, we use these elements that we, we uh, focus on. So, we, and we believe first you got to look and create the culture, make sure the right things are in place. It's the engagement, the organizational culture. You know, the reliability network, you have your document control in place, your KPIs there and so on. And then it gets into standardized work processes. I won't read through the whole list, but like work management uh, would include your planning and scheduling and your CMMS also. And then all the other things on there, then how do you optimize, sustain, that also gets into root cause analysis and you're purchasing a life cycle procurement. And then it's really continuous improvement after that. And what you got to get the bottom layers in, in, in line first if, you, if you're going to really sustain. But you got to use a model. I, I use this to talk about uh, a couple times, but, but I think it's, it's so critical. You know, there was a quote way back in a movie, a really old movie with Robert Redford, Havana, as a butterfly can flutter its wings over a flower in China and cause a hurricane in the Caribbean. Well, you know, you know, I always want to say that went viral. There was no viral back then, but everybody quoted that. It was on the news. It was used in other movies and, and, and so on. It was used on TV shows. Well, I, I guess I got to be the first, to, probably not the first to say, but I will say that's bad physics. It's not true. It's not going to happen. You know, but I kind of get the thought that they were trying to make. You know, if maybe you have a big boulder on the edge of a mountain, and you throw the biggest rock you can pick up on it, you might be able to knock that big boulder over the edge of the mountain, right? But, uh, but what happened was, getting into this, this slide, there was a guy named Lorenz who was a weatherman, and he was doing all this simulation modeling, just like the models you see today when they had the Dorian hurricane, they had a European model, a US model, and they had about six models they run. And he was running all these models, and he would make slight changes in one assumption at the beginning of the model. And as a result of that, he would get totally different results. And so because of the high sensitivity of the starting point, it's very difficult to predict the outcome of complex systems. That whole mathematics became to what is known today as chaos theory. And if you watch Big Bang Theory, the comedy show, they refer to that all the time. That's exactly what they're talking about. So he just made minor changes in the beginning of his model, totally changed the results. And when he put all the results together, it looked like something what you see, or kind of looked like a butterfly. And that's where that word butterfly effect uh, came from and why they used that example in that uh, quote that went semi-viral back then. But let's tie this back into maintenance. So why, why am I talking about this? So what presumably little things or assumptions or changes or things we don't do right on a daily basis in a reliability and maintenance department 
what do we what do we not do or not do right that can have that butterfly effect on your organization? And think about what goes on every day at your workplace. Do you take verbal verbal job requests that should be formal work orders and now they don't get documented? You sometimes get to the job site and discover that operations personnel won't allow the machine to stop. You receive unclear maintenance task direction. You know, this goes to back to maintenance, so they improvise. I've been in the plants where I you know, interviewed you know, the trades technicians, talked to the management. And when it all got done, I asked the people in the, uh, the, the trades, I said, you know, everything that I've seen, I really don't think you can do more than 25% of what you get asked to do on any given day. And, and he said, that's right. That got a lot of management's attention. And then I said, well, here comes the big question. What do you do? So the first thing I do is ignore most of the stuff I get from the CMMS system, from the task and all that. I've been here 25, 30 years. I know what needs to happen to make the plant run, and I just do it to survive or this plant wouldn't run. And so it, that's not the answer anybody wanted to hear. But unfortunately, I see that in, in a lot of places. It isn't always that extreme. But... Rather than speaking up, people do what they got to do to survive. They improvise. They see most jobs prioritize the safety, you know, per those things we talked about earlier. They want it high priority just to get to the top of the list. You skip less critical PM checks because they can't be finished on time. And oh, by the way, they're coming up in another couple of weeks, so we'll just do them then. But it makes the KPIs look good. You struggle to find the correct part because all parts are not coded with a standardized system. And it also affects ordering, reordering, you know, and if, if a part's not kitted or if it's kitted and not used, how does it go back into the system and it goes on and on. You learn that only some of the asset history is captured because work orders aren't closed with enough detail or at all. Or parts because they don't trust the stockroom data. They don't perform root cause analysis, trending, reliability, growth tracking because they lack quality asset data. They see continuous backlog growth, assuming you're counting all work orders not performed. You're unable to predict cost other than it continues to go up. And people doubt the data validity, accuracy, um, though the key performance indicators look good. For the most part, looking at daily plan practices reinforces their distrust. The data looks great, the plan doesn't. Leah, do you want to stop and ask a question here? Um, let's do this real quick because I want to get as much of your data in there as possible. But again, this has everything to do with what you're spot, what you're talking about right now, right? So yep. you just you just it'll, it'll come up in a couple of slides. Yeah. Well, you just mentioned it, right? So the plant looks like <laughs> I won't say it. Um, the plant doesn't look good, but the data does, right? Or you mentioned there earlier about the difference between what the CMMS is telling people to do versus what they know has to be done. So this is more specific. This question about asset health data, but to what extent do you trust the data your system is showing you about asset health data versus what you see about your assets? Okay, I'm going to give it just another 15, 20 seconds get enough votes in, and then uh, we'll get right back. Yeah, while they're doing that, uh, what, mm -hmm. what's what's a hard stop time for the slides for me? And I, I can focus towards that. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can I, go on for days, you know me. I know, I know. And we all kind of want you to, but we also have some questions, right? So we'll, we'll try to stop at around 10 before the hour. So okay, sounds have good. enough time for, for Q&A. All right, I'm going to share the results here. And uh, I think it's good that, you know, 60% of folks at least somewhat trust our data. So that's good. They're on the, they're on the path to, to that collection. Yeah. And, and what happens is, you know, uh, I'm doing some other studies, which, which I can't talk about a lot that are private to companies and, and people thought they had good data and what they're finding out is, oh, they have really good data, but they only have half of it. That's, I hear that all the time right now. It's like we're, we're starting Other to companies uncover. say, well, we have mm -hmm. all the data, but when you look at it, it's not very granular. The quality mm -hmm. is not. Mm -hmm. But now we know at least. All right, I'm going to hide this poll and turn it back to you. All right. So, again, all those things that can go wrong, you know, individually, a few of those things may not be a big deal. But unfortunately, what happens, a lot of those happen every day, all the time, every week, every month. 
the cumulative ignoring many of these little things destroys your RNM process. And it's really, really tough to recover. It's kind of like the, you know, you know, the, the monkey no see, uh, you, you know, you know, talk or hear. So I had to put a, a more modern version on there, right? So I had to put some some uh, more modern robotics there on the right, right? Get those guys doing the same thing. You know? But again, uh, doing all, not doing all those things really can destroy your process. And so again, uh, you know, we're not going to talk about technologies directly. But there's so much opportunity with the technologies and, and, and what you can do. And, and, uh, and heck, we, we have uh, PhD students working on uh, algorithms to interpret infrared for the Department of Energy without people. That's the future. And you look at what's going on. But how do you use that data? How should you be using that data? Um, this is part of a study which is being expanded right now, too. On the bottom is, is the percent predictive maintenance. On the left-hand side is OSHA recordable rate. And some people have struggled to find good uh, correlation with this data, but part of that, I believe, is also uh, the lack of quality of data. And, and so, you know, you look at it and say, oh, the correlation is not there. But if you really dig hard enough, depending on where you look and how you get the data, the, the data is there. And so as you can see here, uh, as you do more predictive maintenance, it does improve your safety also, as logically you would expect putting less people at risk. So I said I put up a slide to say, uh, you know, what's your quartile and, and, and uh, how does it tie into reactive maintenance and also maintenance cost? And here it says maintenance cost is a percent of RAV. That's your placement asset value, meaning if your place disappeared, what's the cost to get it, your building and your production back up and running? But as you can see, first the top quartile. Top, um, top quartile in North America is 9%. 25% of North America is there, 75% is not. Bottom quartile averages 64%. And between fourth and top quartile, that's more than six times the maintenance cost difference. Cost is six times more to run the business. And what's unique is people, you know, it is a little bit different by industry type. You know, if you're a pharmaceutical company, you might range between one and five for most plants. Uh, maintenance cost over REV. If you're a mining company, you might start at seven and go into the 20s. But, but what's unique uh, about the top quartile benchmarks, regardless of what kind of industry you are, there are top quartile performers. So it might be tougher to get there for certain industries, but everybody has, got, has, has people that have gotten there. A little bit about past, present, future. I think we can, we can do this fast. Um, you know, it wasn't that long ago we were punching cards and doing the IBM cards and putting them behind the magic windows. Heck, even when I was in college the first year, they still had slide rules and we're just getting in the computers and stuff. And for the millennials, yes, phones used to have cords. You know, it's just the way it was. And now you can do everything on a calculator and, you know, and, and you used to have cameras. How many people are not using that? You know, the watches. Uh, heck, even when I was going through an MBA program, uh, Part of our effort was to take Switzerland out of the watch business. It ended up becoming as much a uh, fashion statement as it was just a pure, uh, pure uh, uh, timekeeping statement. You know, then pay, how many people still remember pagers? You know, you had to go run to a phone and, and, and so on. And now all these things I put up here, they're all on your phone. You do, you do it with one piece of equipment, right? Yeah, everything works. Now, as a shame with Lee, unfortunately, mine's at the uh, Apple shop right now uh, today. Uh, it's not working, so I have all these functions now that I can't do. But uh, what, what I want to talk about is uh, all of these incoming technologies have the capability of transforming any one of these operations. And you know, all the new things going on and, and all the new concepts and all the things you hear that are coming up, like machine intelligence, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, but how believable and achievable are the promises and how long before it's actually usable? And I mean, not just doable, but affordable and practical. You know, we work with the supercomputers at Oak Ridge National Lab, and we've got you know, students there. We've been helping on the infrastructure for over 10 years now almost. And Titan was capable of 20 petaflops. That's 20,000 trillion calculations every second. You know, um, you know, in 2018, Summit was released. 200 petaflops. Wow, order of magnitude faster. That equates to 6.3 billion people making calculations at the same time every second for one year. Now, you, can't, you can't even fathom how, how much data that actually is. You look at what's coming out here. You, you know, uh, you know, you got, you know, you still got some issues, obviously, with the aging workforce, replacing lost skills. 
but how do you use tools to supplement some of that for training and so on? Uh, companies now are, aren't saying we're going to sell more cars. Some of the same companies are saying it's a robot in every house. You're going to see home products as the biggest in growth in robots, even more than manufacturing coming up, I think, in the next decade. Uh, you know, how do you get more overall information? They're going to have a lot more, and some of it's already out there on health wearables, the jackets that will monitor certain things for you and, and actually prescribe a lot of stuff. So, so again, the opportunity is just phenomenal. But even with all this great stuff happening, 75% of facilities still aren't doing enough predictive maintenance to protect their assets. Most facilities still struggle with full implementation of total productive maintenance especially that last step, you know, how do they get the operators involved and get to some autonomous maintenance and get in operations or the operators to t take um, ownership over the, over the assets and the machinery and the equipment. And TPN has been around over 25 years, and yet North America is still struggling with it. Uh, most suggestion programs, you talk about people engagement in North America, North America averages less than one voluntary suggestion per employee, less than one. This company is doing over 30. So how important is culture, since I've been beating up on that some? You see a line there that's got eight company, or excuse me, eight plants that do about the same thing within one division of a large company. And on the bottom is a plant reliability maturity uh, matrix. It's got uh, uh, about 14 elements tied into it. On the left-hand side is, or is the organization culture element pulled out. And you can see how highly lined up is maturity the reliability process which are with an engaged workforce and organizational culture. And there's companies that start in the bottom, like where those two X's are, and they'll make it also. They're just starting at a lower place. There's companies that will start at a low place, and they'll accelerate above all those points up there because they have the right culture. Now, having the right culture isn't going to save you alone. I mean, you can go out of business smiling, but the right culture will get you there faster. If you're lucky enough to get to a top quartile performance, you can also have a better chance of sustaining it. So, so and I get asked often, is a culture, is it working, you know, is culture helping the maturity of the reliability process, or is the reliability process working in teams helping culture? I don't really care what the percentages are back and forth because they both help each other. You know, if, if, you, if you engage the people, culture is going to get better. I, I, I borrowed this from Gardner. I'm not going to read through it, but it'll, it'll be in the presentation. But it kind of shows you all the emerging technologies. And the one that I want to point out is to see at the bottom there, the one that's kind of crashed away on the bottom, where it says trough of disillusionment. It's augmented reality. You know, not as easy to implement and all the right things to do. Uh, uh, you know, they take a lot more work. Uh, doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do, but it's got to be very focused. And you got to think about how you want to implement these. You look at some things on the left, smart dust. That's nanotechnology smart dust. If they see things like 4D printing, well, we know 3D printing, but now they're talking 4D printing. That really puts a time element to it. That means you can put in the 3D object somewhere, and based on adding heat or some other kind of parameter change, that 3D object will grow to a certain shape. Just think of the, the phenomenal concepts around that. So, again, I won't read through that, but the point I want to make is, is that these technologies are coming so fast, people don't even know how to react to them or when to get into them. I'm going to give a really quick history without reading through all the items, but you know, you know, all the way back from the 50s, some fixes to when it's broke, then some computer usage, you know, some shutdown stuff, and then we start getting into the 1980s and the design for reliability, all the things we're talking about now, the RCM, the FMEAs, PM optimization, and so on, you know, more analytics, condition monitoring, and in between all these, I put what I call zone uncertainties, because there's a lot of people that don't know how fast to jump on these changes. And some are just waiting to see what happens, and they'll jump on later. But there's usually about four or five years of confusion as all these things come about. But remember what was said earlier, 10 years ago, if we don't get better at culture, we won't be able to get to the tough problems you know, near the plant floor. And, and again, again, we're seeing that with results. Uh, this is just a continuation now of that same chart at 2010. And now we're seeing precision maintenance that we talked about. Do you... Are your people really precision maintenance trained? The whole Internet of Things, we don't need to talk about that. The systems thinking cloud, I think everybody's up to speed on that. More comprehensive analytics are possible today. Prescriptive maintenance, that simply means you, you got a little bit of algorithms or machine intelligence tied to it, 
and now your information is getting taken by computer and your computer now generates work orders. So you have some airlines actually taking advantage of that already. So, so there's some pretty neat things happening out there. Augmented reality, we've talked about, but I think there's still a lot more practical applications needed on, on the plant floor than, than what's available today. Uh, machine intelligence uh, is, is happening. Uh, edge compu computing, everything won't go up to the cloud. Uh, again, again, there's, there's uh, edge computing helps security, uh, it gets faster computing da down below the cloud. So, so that, that's going to be a big change. Some people feel the majority will not go to the cloud in the future. So, you know, is that a disruptor or isn't it? Something to talk about. Uh, I was fortunate to uh, keynote part of the OSI Soft Conference in San Francisco in April this year. Half the vendors out there were, were talking about edge computing. Um, big issue now is data integrity that we talked about. At, at some point here, it's going to be plug and play. Now we're talking 2019, 2020, which is today. At some point, it's going to be plug and play when you start getting more into machine intelligence. But what good does that do you if you don't trust your data? If you don't trust your data. And I've been to some phenomenal companies that have experts on libel analysis. And I'm like, why? Why aren't you doing this? You get it. You got people that you wish other people had. And the answer is very simple but sad is we don't trust our data. You got, you get, even if you can't do any of this other stuff on, that's futuristic, get your data cleaned up. Get your data cleaned up. So when it is plug and play, you can take advantage of some of this stuff. Now, what's coming up in the next five years? I put purchasing for reliability and maintainability. That's just my dream and hope, you know, that at some point, uh, purchasing finally gets on board with reliability and maintainability. Quantum computing, uh, that's not going to be a game changer. That'll be a world changer. And kind of like we look at computing with pluses and minuses and on or off and bits and bytes and so on. Instead of having just that on and off signal, think of it more in terms of a sphere. Now you got all these pluses and minuses floating around, and they can be used synergistically. It gets a little little crazier than that talking about it because the physics all go out of whack, and it has to be done at you know pretty much sub-zero temperatures or absolute zero, which is in the minus 400 you know what is it 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which is outer space type temperatures. So the trick now is how do we do quantum computing? It's closer to room temperatures because when that happens, computers will not be 10 times faster, a thousand times faster, but millions times faster. It will be a world changer, but that's coming. And then neural networks to get, get computers to think more like the human brain, still a little ways off, but, th but that's uh, slowly getting better too. The question is how will your business be impacted? Uh, I, I think you need to focus not just on asset performance, but also on asset health. And some studies and books I've read, I, I put all the references down there, they, they've shown that if you equally concentrate on asset performance performance and asset health, that's really the engagement and the people side of the business, you're much, much more likely to be successful. And they, they identified four levers of influence model for cultural success, meaning that I will change my mindset and behavior to do it the right way you know, if, if you have the understanding and conviction to, to do that, you have the reinforcement mechanisms. I mean, are the processes in place to support that? Do I have the confidence and skill building, like the precision maintenance? And is, and is my management team walking the talk? If these four things aren't in place, you got a shot at it. But so far, North America hasn't shown that they've been able to do that. I'm just going to mention uh, most uh, those of you that are on this uh, webinar, I'll send you an invite to the benchmarking study uh, that I'm starting again. It's free. Participants get a summary of the results. So it's as simple as that. So, so with that, Leah, uh, you're back on. <laughs> that was amazing. That's I go. <laughs> that, was, that was. So we're getting a lot of questions in. And I would say a lot of them roll up under how do we change the culture, right? What steps have you seen that are effective in moving the culture over to where it needs to be um, and helping to change levels of engagement and so forth? Well, the, the, first, the first question is, is you know, do, do you have a, a cultural engagement program? You know, do, do, you have a, do you have a model that you follow? Is it something that you're doing? Um, so again, uh, I, I would I would maybe go back to the slide. It might be an easier way to answer it. Go for it. Live live audience. Go for it. 
if you if you follow this model, because it's saying if you do these things right, mm-hmm. you got a good chance of getting change. I mean, Cotter's got his eight steps. I think they're good. You know, there's a lot of models out there to follow. Mm-hmm. But if I were to follow here what I mentioned, the four levers of the influence model, understanding and conviction, that means I understand what's being asked of me and it makes sense, right? Did you take it down to the plan floor level? So not just, yeah, I kind of believe the metrics, but here's what I need to do differently. That's number one. Number two is the reinforcement me- mechanisms. That's you see that the structures, processes, systems, incentives support the change. You know, as the company said, this is important to the company. Mm-hmm. Three is competence and skill building. Do you have the skills and opportunities to behave in a new way? Are you really precision maintenance trained? Do you understand your role in the big picture and why what you're doing is important? Are you getting feedback? So training, lots of right. training, and, lots of communication. And it's the right kind of training also. Mm-hmm. And then the fourth one is really the role model. Do I see my leaders, colleagues, staffs behaving differently? You know, are, are they going there? And it's not an, it's not an easy thing, and, and especially in a – Western culture environment, you know, our leadership changes so much and everybody needs to or wants to put their mark on the business. It's tough to get sustainable change when you have leadership changing every two years. Yep. Yep. So not unsurprisingly, we had a lot of questions pop up too when you had that slide up. And I'm looking for the number. Um, about I will ask well, while you're doing culture. that. I mean, I, I think you said earlier, we'll answer all the questions that come in that we don't have time for. We that, will. We will. Um, if you want to zoom back to slide 35, a bunch of questions popped up there too. Um, and I remember I, I asked the same question of how do you measure culture? Because you said you had an index. Could you talk a little bit about what your what data points? Because I know you're surveying people and you're asking you're you're using survey logic to compile the data. But what are you what are you measuring to get a cultural index? Well, there's uh, two things. We have a short and a long version of that. Uh, these are done with the long version, uh, but but you know, we have about 25 questions that we ask. We you know uh, we interview depending on the size of, a, of the plant or company anywhere from uh, 20 to 80 people in in the facility. So it's one-on-one closed door interviews. Plus we observe, we go through the plant, and we we actually assess do your culture assessment. We we go to team meetings. So it's a, so it's part of our we do a three-day assessment on reliability and maintainability. One piece of that is culture. Okay. Okay, because I think people see it as, as kind of a squishy thing of how do you measure it, but you you have managed to to scientifically. Yeah, yeah what I've what I've done is taken a longer a longer uh, list of questions on, on a whole assessment and mm-hmm. say I think I can answer less questions and come up with pretty much the same results. And so we have a, a shorter version of that also that we do in three days. And, and mm-hmm. uh, but it's not just culture; it's it's really looking at uh, uh, the fourteen elements of reliability and maintainability. Culture is one of those. Mm-hmm. We also got questions about data in terms, because you you pointed out, you know, we're not collecting enough data or the right kinds of data. So I know it's a a big open-ended question, but um, what is the right kind of data to to be collecting in order to move along from reactive to a culture where everyone trusts the data to then being able to act on the data? Well, it's... First of all, I think I think it's it's not having volume of data. It's having good metrics that that you want to move forward with. Um, mm-hmm. Most companies that I go to, you know, medium to large companies have over 100 and 100 to 150 KPIs. And that's too much. That's not enough. Wait, way, way too much. When I say it's way too much, if that's what your corporate needs, you do that, right? Because everybody does part of that. But you can't drive your business alone that way. You've got to figure out what do you want to make your mark on in the next year or two. Mm-hmm. And what are those three, four metrics that will be levers to, to attack all those pain points? Mm-hmm. I mean, to me, re- reducing reactive maintenance is the biggest piece of that. But then how do, how do you get there? Right. Uh, re- reactive maintenance, that's, a, that's a, 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 a lagging indicator, right? It's after the fact, right? You say I did yes. too much reactive. But at the same time, reducing reactive maintenance is your best leading indicator for improving safety. So it impacts safety also. Yes. It really depends... The same, the same indicator can be leading or lagging depending on what you're measuring. So how about and, a more granular level when it comes into collecting data that, that's flowing into your CMMS, right? So Yeah, and when, when I say granular level, I, I mean believable, you know, so, that, so they can, uh-huh. you know, granular enough that, that, that uh, you know, if you're putting cost, cost doesn't have to be perfect, but, you know, it should be plus or minus 10, 20%, not half of it mm-hmm. missing. You know, mm-hmm. you put all your work orders in. 
uh, you know, can you track cost and, and work, you know, and and, uh, and parts back to the right assets? So it's more trusting the data than, than getting even more granular. When I say granular, it's also trusting it. You know, there's too many holes in the data. Right, right. So do you see that people are capturing, like, the right, the right quantity and accuracy of data at the at the asset level? Yeah, I, I I think people are making attempts to get the right data, but it, it's not consistent enough, and some of it's just not enough. You know, there, there's just too many holes in it, and and the and the only reason I'm you know, I'm, I'm kind of slowing down a little bit on avoiding it is is I can't mention any company names, but I'm doing another <laughs> no, no, no. doing another study on reliability and safety, uh -huh. which nobody will ever know who those companies are, and that was the agreement. No, understood. And and, and so. Uh, and so again, that's where I'm seeing a lot of these data thing issues. You know, so it's going back and forth a lot. And well, what about this? What about that? And all of a sudden, wow! Well, I thought I had better data than I did. Or I thought it was more integrated. Or I thought it'd be easier to get. Or it's mm -hmm. not. Or again, it's like we said before. It's good data, but you only have half of it. Well, and the other half, well, it didn't really get put in. You know, and, and so on. So, so again, th those are the kind of issues when I say granular. It's not just yep. you know, the level of detail. Yep, our audience is, is asking questions about, you know, um, what kind of data should I collect so that I can make progress, so that I can move forward? Um, is it all about the, you know, asset hierarchy? Is it all about the different kinds of key indicators? What, what kind of data, if I was to prioritize, should I um, pick as my top three or four things that I'm, I'm focusing on? Well, I would look at reactive maintenance. I would look at how engaged your people are. Uh, because again, uh, how how um, robust is your continuous improvement process? You know, are are you if you look at it over a long period of time, are you just fixing the same stuff over and over again? You know, that's what Einstein's definition of insanity, right? <laughs> right. Doing the same right. thing over and over again, expecting better or different results. Well, I, I see the majority of companies, I call it maintenance insanity. They're fixing the same stuff over and over again over a longer period of time because they're not really doing the root cause analysis and doing the finding and the fixing and, and so on. And that's not poking anybody. You know, a lot of them are stuck in processes that they inherited or, you know, resource constraints and, and, and so mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. so, so it's just tough to do. But if, if you don't figure out how to get there, it will never get better. I mean, still, right. if all you are is reactive and you don't do anything different, you might as well get good at reactive because doing no maintenance is worse, right? But but <laughs> you don't want to be reactive. You don't want to be highly time-based. You need to start moving up the ladder. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Could could I get you to forward back through the slides then? Because I want to share the uh, backwards, uh, like, all the way to the end there. Uh, to the end or to the front? To the end, to the accelerate slide. Because you're going to be speaking about some of this live uh, in November down in Florida and folks have the ability to come there we go um, so this conference is is open for registration now and you will be speaking there and obviously um, we want to encourage everyone to come because the focus is all about improving reliability maintenance how do you get there what kind of data do you need to collect what kind of processes the rest of it with lots of different experts on deck including yourself thank you very much for coming um, and uh, I think it's a great fit for most of the folks here. And then if you want to forward one more slide, um, as we mentioned, everyone who completes the survey that I'm about to trigger will receive a copy of Klaus's slides and we will go through the questions that people have entered and we will make sure to answer those. We'll probably post a Q&A up on the Excelix website here shortly. So with that, uh, thank you very, very, very much, Klaus. Um, I so appreciate every chance I have to get you on the phone. And thank you for sharing all of the, the up-to-date wisdom that you have. It's pretty awesome. Well, thanks, everybody, for your time. I know it's all valuable. So. Yay. All right, everybody. Have a great day. And um, best of luck with everyone's goals to decrease reactive maintenance and get further up that ladder.